<clears throat> so this is our third day of this uh, retreat in Tampa at the Franciscan Center. in the year 2015. And we are practicing uh, the path to wholeness. And over these last days, uh, from uh, these wonderful ancients, from the 6th century and the 7th century, uh, and we've learned some uh, very important things, haven't we? Uh, we've learned that uh, that our intrinsic nature, who and what we really are, is already whole. Wholeness is not something you have to make. Wholeness is not something you have to get to. Wholeness is not something you have to think about. Wholeness is already here. Now that is quite dramatic. I hope we understand the import of that simple statement. It is not only that you do not, uh, that who you think you are is not who you are. It is actually because you think you are something or, not, or else that you feel disconnected and separate. The very instrument that you are using to find your way is a defective instrument. That is important to understand. Thought in and of itself is binary. Black only exists because of white. Up only exists because of down. Enlightenment only exists because of ignorance. Buddha only exists because of sentient beings. You know, it's, it's only... Words are the language of duality, of separation. They cannot reveal truth. That which is speaking the words... <laughs> That's what you want to know. As the great master said, it is the moon you want to look at, not the finger pointing at the moon. A young acolyte got his finger cut off because he told people that his teacher's Zen was the finger. So this uh, message from the ancients that we are intrinsically whole and complete just as we are. There is nothing we need to do to make it happen. You can't make it happen. They actually say, the more you think on this, the further from the truth you get. And, what we, and yet we are endlessly thinking about this. Jacqueline's even endlessly asking questions about this. Now there are certain questions that lead us toward, toward in the direction of the truth, uh, but most of the questions we ask are just more the same, just perpetual.
perpetuate. So if your shoulders are tensed, right? What do you do? What do you do, Diane, if your shoulders are tense? Relax them. You don't talk to Chris about your tense shoulders? No, you don't go read a book about tense shoulders? I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Relax your shoulders. Relax your shoulders, right. I mean, this is why Zen is called a direct path, right? Yeah, I mean, you can take the other path, right? You know. But the direct path says, you know, very clearly, you know, your shoulders are tense, this is what you do. That already your body has the capacity to be relaxed, to be whole, to feel good. Right? But there are things that we do that make them tense, so just relax them. Okay? We all do that, don't we? When our body is tense, we relax it. Huh. That's easy, isn't it? That feels better. So this mind of ease, this mind of well-being, this mind of wholeness, right, is already here. But what do we do? We tense up. Our mind tenses up. And for so many of us, our mind have been tensed up for so many decades we don't even know that it's tense, right? It's like some people, they go to a massage, whatever, they, massage therapist, and people go, they start poking around, they go, wow, you're tense. <laughs> and you go, gee, I didn't know that. Uh, I thought this was normal, you know, this is the way I am. They say, no, you got knots all over your body. You're surprised, aren't you? Because inside, it feels normal. So we have these minds, tense, they're constricted. What are they constricted around? Thoughts, perceptions, ideas, views, stories, dramas, melodramas, memory. I mean, it's endless, right? Each one of those is a constriction. Each one of those is a tightness. Right? We go through the day and rather just than flowing in awareness. Right? Just being present to whatever arises, being present to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Right? Don't hold on to anything, don't make a big deal about anything, just be present, just deal with whatever rides. You know, if, you, if, if you're going to a birth, what do you do? You're happy. You don't have to, right? If you go to a funeral, you're sad. I mean, that's, right? I mean, is there anything I'm missing? Right. If in the morning you went to a, a birth, you were happy. In the afternoon, if you went to a funeral, you were sad. Right? When you came home at night, you know what? free and easy. It's not that you're a stone. It's not that you're indifferent. You're the opposite. But we don't do that, do we? We obsess. We worry. We repeat. We anticipate. We have all kinds of ideas of how life should be. Right? Somebody was telling me this morning that, uh, you know, that sometimes their life is... Uh, is uh, six lane highways and sometimes their life is potholes and it was very clear uh, they had a preference right <laughs> they think life should be all six lane highways <laughs> and right away you know somebody like that is suffering they're suffering from their attachment to wanting things one way and they're suffering from their aversion from having things another way and that's it's and that and that is only set up in the mind 
Right. When you're on a six-lane highway, you go fast. When you're on a road with potholes, you go slow. That's all. That's all. No big deal. So when we relax our shoulders, we let go. Right? In terms of the mind, we let go of our preferences. We let go of our likes and dislikes. We let go of all those things that we are imposing on the world. Remember yesterday, it's on a Buddhist psychology. We see sights. How wonderful. For those of us who can still see, how wonderful that we can see this beautiful world and these beautiful people. How wonderful. We also see uh, not so beautiful things. That's wonderful too. We smell, we hear sounds, we taste, we feel, we're aware. Right? Inside, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories arise. It's all, it's just endless arisings and passings, right? Things that are appearing to our senses and our mind. That's all that's going on. But we grab, we leave our true home, our awareness, our awareness of, and we enter the, we enter the object. We grasp. We make a story about everything. We have a view about everything. That is attachment. That is leaving our true home, coming out into the world, and grabbing on. And you wonder why the mind is not at ease, why the mind is not peaceful. How can it be? Can you see, how can it be? It's tight. We're tightening around everything. And, and, you know, sometimes it's just a little tension in the shoulders. Sometimes it's nuts. Right? So we, in, our, in our minds, it's the same way. <laughs> but who can say they go through the day with a relaxed and easy mind? Just moving from one situation to another, open, spacious, responding to whatever is happening. No. That is the way. That is the way our ancestors have showed us. And everybody here is capable of that. Because it's already here. Does anybody not doubt me? Not doubt me, doubt the ancestors. I'm just, uh, just carrying water for the big boys. <laughs> Does anybody doubt it? I mean, I'm serious when I say that. This is important. These are, these are fundamentals. You know? And if we were in church, you know... Pastor might be saying, "Does anybody, you know, not believe in God? You know, let's get let's get this straight because here, you know, <laughs> you know, this is about believing in God, right? So c come talk to me, right? So it's sort of like that. It's a little different. I mean, anybody this doesn't make sense, so they don't believe it. Don't be, don't be, don't be." shy, don't be scared. So we're, we're among believers here. Yeah, oh, one non-believer. Good. Yeah. I always like to investigate and experience Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
I don't experience it, I have to realize that you Hmm. Lester. Lester. <laughs> Here it is, Lester. I say Lester and you say yes. Is there any thought in that? No. Just relax, Lester. When I say Lester, you say yes. You know who you are. You respond spontaneously. Could it be this simple, Lester? Did you enjoy your breakfast? Yes. Look at this miraculous mind, right? You don't have to, you know, go back into the kitchen and, uh, you know, go through the pots, right? You know. Just, just relax and be present and trust your natural spontaneous mind to take care of things. You want it to be more than that, don't you? You want fireworks. You want to read books about it. Right. That wisdom that is written in the books that you love Where'd that wisdom come from? I mean, was the original uh, person, uh, you know, got it from reading a book? Lester? Where'd the Buddha get the Buddha Dharma from? Inside. Looked inside what? Inside. And what did he discover? Really? There was like a, this little path running around inside his head? <laughs> Lester, you're a bright man. Was there like a little road kind of zooming around through his head? What did he discover? What did he discover? Oh, he discovered wholeness. Now, if he discovered it, it must have meant it was already there. Right? You know, we, we go, Columbus discovered America. <laughs> well, America was already there. And there happened to be millions of people living on it. But we, 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 we kind of go, oh, as if, you know, there was nothing there and then Columbus made this discovery. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> what did the Buddha discover? And he wasn't called the Buddha then. What was he called, Lester? Yeah, Siddhartha Gautama. Right? He discovered his wholeness. And he didn't get it from reading. He just got it from returning home. And if he was here and we said to him, we asked him, Buddha, you know what he would say? Yes. And if we said to him, Buddha, did you enjoy your breakfast? He would say, yes. It is as simple as this. Let us return to the grass hut. No, no I, I want to return to the grass hut. If at the end you still have questions. Okay, I just, thinking of time, I just want to. Such beautiful poetry. Or a song. Are there any musicians in the room? Maybe they could create a song. Put it to music. Song of the Grass Roof Hermitage. Yesterday we read, I've built a grass hut where there's nothing of value. Right. You may live in a 5,000 square foot home filled with valuable things. 
You may live in a little uh, shack with only a few things. When the fire burns, at the end they both are just ashes. Nothing of real intrinsic value. After eating, I relax and enjoy a nap. The natural way. When the hut was completed, right, fresh weeds appeared. That is the natural order of things. Things just change, things grow, things... Some roads are six lanes, some roads are potholes. That's just the way it is. You finish the dishes one night, have breakfast in the morning, and what do you have? More dishes. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? I mean, it's endless, isn't it? That could be a burden, that could be a disappointment, that could be a frustration, but that could just be just the way it is, and you do it with happiness. You understand this is the way life is. How wonderful. First I cook my breakfast, then I eat my breakfast, then I wash up afterwards. How wonderful. The miraculous activity. Uh, now it's been lived in, covered by weeds, and we said yesterday it could very well be that the hut is a metaphor for this body, for the world of physical form, covered by weeds. Right? Some people again might despair at all the weeds. But he says the person in the hut lives here calmly. There's the challenge to us. Am I dwelling calmly in my hut, in my body, in my life? And again, that not stuck to inside, outside, or in between. Again, what he means. Inside is the world of the mind. In this case, we're talking about uh, small mind. Inside is the world of what? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories. Right? That's, that's, that's the inner life. That's, the, that's what's on inside, right? Uh, nobody can see that, can they? You see that, but nobody else can see it. That's your, that's your inside, so to speak. Right? Outside is all the things that our senses see. The world of phenomena. Right? That's the outside. In between is what? Is the act of uh, seeing. The act of hearing. Right? What links the ear with the sound? Hearing. Right? What links the eye with the object? Seeing. Right? Is that clear? What links uh, the mind to the thoughts is uh, awareness, consciousness of. Right? Okay. The person is calm because they are not stuck emphasis is stuck. It doesn't say. It doesn't have an inside. doesn't have an outside. doesn't have an in-between. Right? We all have that, don't we? We all have life. We all have thoughts. We all have feelings. We all have all the things uh, that we see and do, and right? Okay. But he or she is not stuck. There's the key word. It's sort of what I was saying earlier. We are stuck. We just go from morning till night. Stuck, 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 stuck. And then we have learned to get unstuck. So we, we, we basically, you know, it's like, what am I doing all day? I'm getting stuck and then I'm getting myself unstuck. <laughs> right. And then I wake up the next day and I start all over. <laughs> yeah. From morning till night. Big things, little things. You know, I just cannot leave this alone. Getting stuck, 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 stuck. At home, 
driving, on the phone, at work, right? No matter where we go, any relationship we have, anything we do, we hear the new. You know, it's like stuck, 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 stuck. So we just stick to everything. And because we're practicing, we work very hard to get unstuck. It's a lot of work. Why not not get stuck in the first place? That's why I say to people in our Sangha, yeah, letting go is a good practice. But why get attached? If you don't get attached, you don't have to be always letting go. There is something a lot easier. Why grasp in the first place? Right? You know. And I'm glad you've learned that when you pick up something hot that's going to burn you, you have learned to let go. That's wise. But, you know, why don't you, after you've been burned a couple of times, why don't you just stop picking it up? And there are people in this room who have been burnt in situations, relationships, ideas, thousands and thousands of times. Same stuff over and over and over again. Same issues. Right? And yet, new day, you know, where can I stick myself today? <laughs> you know? You would think that after getting burnt a bunch of times, I mean, little children learn that. <laughs> right? And they learn it pretty quickly. Right? And yet we just go on and on and on. And we even talk to each other about it. <laughs> and we go to therapy about it. We join Dharma communities about it. And we go to retreats about it. And we read books about it. Right? And yet we still do it. Please uh, reflect on that. Not getting stuck. You don't get stuck when you remain at home within your awareness, within your mindfulness. Everything you see, everything you hear, you know, you respond to, but you don't grasp at it. You don't attach to it. You let it be. Because you understand things are the way they are. Right? That's all. Things are the way they are. Babies are born. People die. That's all. Causes and conditions. Why is this person going through this? Causes and conditions. That's all. Why is it a beautiful day? Causes and conditions. You know, why was it like another kind of day? Just causes and conditions, right? That's all. Just be present to it. Touch it with your awareness. But don't go out. We're always going out. Grabbing on to, pushing away. And we wonder why we don't feel whole. Because we're in parts. Our internal psychological life is in parts. It's compartmentalized. There's no wholeness to it. It's just a, a conglomeration of stuck events. Is that clear? And there's a feeling that comes from that, which is a feeling of uh, disconnection. There's no wholeness in that. Your current awareness is whole and complete. It has no inside, it has no upside, it has no back, it has no forward, it has no beginning and no end. Why not rest in that? But we just can't leave it be. Right? If 
there's not something to worry about, if there's not something to be upset about, if there's not something to be hurt about, hurt about, if there's not something to be resentful about, if there's not something, uh, you know, to get, that's got to get done, right? We're like what? Bored. You know, where's the drama? Right? And then we come to recruit and we complain about, you know, all the drama in our life. It's like, <laughs> you know. Not stuck to inside, outside, in between places where people live. He doesn't live realms where people love. She won't, doesn't love. I will not go on my uh, South Tampa, Naples rant today. You'll, <laughs> I'll spare you that one. Uh, but it's important. Uh, there was a meaning in that. It's important he says that, especially for us, because we are people of the world. We are people uh, with homes and jobs and families and relationships and things. It is important for us. The expression to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay. We can fully participate in the world. There are models within Buddhism. The Buddha himself uh, was not that way. Right? He, he, he took the other way uh, when uh, his, his path uh, to awakening was leaving the world. He left his beautiful home and he left his family and he left his, right? Uh, and, and that was one way. Uh, obviously, uh, Shittu uh, also was that way. Uh, uh, but we have uh, great models like uh, Vimla Kirti. Vimla Kirti Sutra of... Uh, uh, of this very wealthy uh, businessman layman uh, whose enlightenment was so profound that everywhere and everything he did and, uh, and he went everywhere and did everything in life uh, he was able to uh, use all those circumstances uh, to bring benefit to others he was in the world totally involved in every kind of worldly activity uh, but he was not of the world he was of the dharma it was of truth. Though the hut is small, it includes the entire world. In ten feet square, an old man illumines forms in their nature. The world is a concept. The world we know, and to know a piece is to know the whole. Right. Because the whole is made up of pieces. So to know the piece is to know the whole. <coughs> this is the world right here. It is not somewhere else. Is not air here? Is not earth here? Is not sky here? Right. What isn't here? This is the world. You are nature. You are the natural world. believe that. I mean, <laughs> look at the world. It, it's continuous. You know, it doesn't stop. I mean, we, there, there may be a boundary out there between somebody's property and the other. You know, those are legal things. The earth is whole. It's one earth. And we are one with the earth. And this place right here is, is the earth, is the world. Everything is here. And your mind, your awareness illumines the world. It lights up the world. We are not stones. We are not inanimate. We 
wander, and we wander, we wander, we wander, looking, looking, searching, searching. And it's already here. At the end of the day, what the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter, returns home. Always was the heir to the throne. That's a, that's our story. We wander here, we wander there, thinking that we are missing something, lacking something, needing something. And it is that very idea that is perpetuating this sense of lack, this sense of disconnection. Ten feet square, an old man illumines forms in their nature. Our mind and its awareness lights up the things of this world. And everything reveals its nature. Flowers have their own nature. We don't have to read a book about flowers to understand the nature of a flower. We look, we smell, feel. We understand the nature of the flower. That is, it's our, it's our awareness that illumines the world. Is that clear? And that, and that capacity is whether you are in a vast estate or whether you're just in a little tiny enclosure. Didn't Blake say to see the world in a grain of sand? In heaven in a child's smile? Something like that, yeah. It's not grandiose. It's right here, and it's intimate. Uh, the next line, let me just, the hut is small. It includes the entire world. Do you have to see every flower in the world? Or is this enough? When is enough? How much do I need? problem with the more flowers we have, the less we see the one. That's why the one who lives in the grass hut may have a deeper appreciation of life and things than those who live in much larger dwellings with many more things. Does adding more and more and more, more things, more space, more activities, more experiences, does that really make our life richer? We need to think, you know, does it? These next lines are really wonderful. A Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. The middling or lowly can't help wondering, will this hut perish or not? <coughs> now, uh, uh, we know, psychologically conditioning speaking, 
Many people have what are called in the trade trust issues. Anybody ever heard that word? <coughs> right. There's a name for it. There may be many people here who have trust issues. Right. For various reasons because of their life conditioning. He writes, a Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. The uh, song we recite in the morning is called Trust in Mind. So it's the same thing, isn't it? When you trust. Well, let's go the other way. When you don't trust, when you're in a relationship where you don't trust, what is that like? Miserable. Okay. I like Chris, he goes right for the heart of it. <laughs> what else characterizes a relationship where there is mistrust? One is what? Fearful. Fearful. One is suspicious. suspicious. One is doubting. Tentative. Tentative. Unhappy. Unhappy. Back. Hold, holds back. Cautious. Yeah, yeah, a lot. So, I mean, please reflect on that because, uh, again, He's saying, a Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. And we see uh, miserable, unhappy, suspicious, doubting, tentative, uh, cautious, suspicious. Uh, these are all qualities in a relationship uh, that are, we would say, are not healthy. Everyone agree with me? <laughs> these are not healthy for the relationship. And if you want a good relationship with somebody or something, uh, that is not that, is it? That is a contamination of relationship. And it will undermine the closeness, the intimacy of the relationship, right? Okay. So, a Mahayana Bodhisattva trusts without doubt. Again, Mahayana is this uh, bodhisattvic uh, path, or we might say the, the great path of, of personal awakening and service to others. That's the Mahayana. And a bodhisattva is one who is working that path uh, of enlightenment, enlightened living. Trust without doubt. There are many people who have been around Dharma for many years. Many retreats, many intensives, many even teachers. And still do not trust. When the child trusts the parent, when the child trusts the parent, no matter what the situation is, the parent just takes the child's hands and, and the child knows what? They're safe. The parent will take care of them. Right? That is a good relationship between a parent and a child, isn't it? Right? To have that sense of trust. This person only wants my good. They will never do anything to harm me. I can trust them. Right? I can have confidence in, the, in, in you know, uh, it's quite amazing with young children. Uh, sort of uh, having grandchildren now, I'm kind of re-experiencing things. How much trust they have. I mean, we just pick them up and take them wherever we want. You know, it's like uh, you know, pick them up, put them in the in the car seat, and off we go. You know, they have no idea where we're going. <laughs> right? It's quite amazing, but it's because they what? They trust. 
They have complete confidence in us. Right? It's wonderful. They trust. You know, let's go. Take their hand. They have no idea where they're going. Take them here, take them there. You know. They don't, they, I mean, they have no choice in the matter at all, do we? We take them wherever we want. We never even ask them. <laughs> and they just come along quite happily. Just, just looking around, holding your hand. Holding, you know, being held by you. Looking around. Right? How wonderful. Trust. They trust us. Because they trust us, because they have confidence. I mean, they don't know these words, but that's what's going on. They are what? They are relaxed. They are at ease. You know? Is that clear? For those of you who didn't grow up that way, that's what it is. And if you have a trust issue, it's because that was not your experience. Your experience might have been more of the other. But that is a contamination of an un... That's an unhealthy relationship. Please understand, that's an unhealthy relationship. That is not normal. <coughs> Mother birds protect their young. Birds. You know, they got tiny little brains. Right? You know? I mean, all day they'll be very busy getting food for their young. And if some big bird or animal comes out at the peril of their own life, they'll protect them. You know? And that is the truth of the natural world. But our world, unfortunately, because of all kinds of contaminations and delusions, uh, many parents, that has not been passed on from parent to child. So many people don't have that relationship. But it is necessity. Now, what is it that you need to trust? I mean, at the deepest sense, we're saying, trust your mind. Trust your natural mind. But the truth is, for most of us, we don't experience it yet, do we? Right? That is the truth. So we're left in a predicament. We're in a dilemma, aren't we? I'm stuck. No matter what I do, no matter what I try, I can't get unstuck. I'm like the tar baby, you know. Keep getting stuck. I need help. Can't do it by myself. I can't see clear enough. I don't have this confidence, I don't know the way, I don't have the strength, I don't, whatever. I need help, I need support, I need guidance, right? Uh-oh, got a dilemma here. What's a dilemma? Can you see the dilemma we're in? I'm going to have to trust somebody or something. <laughs> <laughs> So most of us uh, do not do. A Mahayana Bodhisattva trusts without doubt. Many of us in this room, uh, we trust with doubt. <laughs> we trust with a little suspicion, with a little caution, with a little holding back. Uh, we, we mix it up. As I was saying to somebody yesterday, uh, uh, we glibly say, oh, I know they're all stories. But in truth, in the actuality of our life, we actually divide it up. There are those stories 
we know are just stories, and then there are those stories which are real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is real. You know? <laughs> Can you see how we play it? We, we play both sides. We take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, we take refuge in the teacher, but we still reserve the right to do it mostly our own way. Right? That's the truth, isn't it? A Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. The child trusts without doubt. And it is happy. And it, is, it has complete confidence in us. And so it is at at ease. Where do you want to go, Grandpa? He'll, he'll go anywhere. Let's go somewhere. He doesn't care. Even if I told him, he, his mind isn't developed enough that he really understands it anyhow. It's like, let's just go. It doesn't matter. How wonderful. That mind of wonder. That mind of trust. That mind of ease. Everyone in this room had that mind. Still has that mind. Just layered with disappointment and hurt and all that stuff. A Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. In the Mahayana, there are very clear teachings about uh, about uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha teacher, and very clear teachings about the criteria for judging whether uh, a source, uh, an object of refuge, is worthy of refuge. Okay? So it's not like blind faith, this is not cultism. You know, there's real criteria to investigate. But, <laughs> having made the investigation, having made the investigation and decided, yes, uh, this Buddha Dharma Sangha stuff is really worthy. It's tried and true. It's intelligent. It's wise. It's meaningful. It's it's experimental. Exper experiential. It's been it's been tested for twenty six hundred years. Uh, the teachers are authentic teachers. They're you know you know they're not in it for their own ego gratification. They're not just perpetuating delusion. You know uh, you know. At that point. Are you willing to take their hand and go where they lead you? When you do, you can relax. You don't have to figure it out for yourself. You can't figure it out for yourself because that very instrument that's trying to figure it out is the problem. <laughs> it's not your fault. As Bill's teacher Banke says, you know, it's like, uh, you know, there's a blood stain on the floor and, you're, and you take your rag and you dip it in a bucket of blood to, to clean it up. And you wonder why the stain doesn't go away. You know, that's what we're doing. You know, the same mind that's creating the problem, you're now using to get yourself out of the problem. Huh? The same mind that got you stuck, you're now using to get yourself unstuck. Do you see the inherent contradiction in that? <laughs> it is a, what's called a closed system. There's no way out. We need somebody to lead us out. Somebody who's outside the system who can so, come on, you, there's, a, there's a road here that you don't see, but it's there. It'll, it'll get you out of the closed system. A Mahayana Buddhist trusts without doubt. The middling or lowly can't help wondering, will this perish, will this hut perish or not? Right? Sound like anybody you know? Right? Always, always thinking about the future, always wondering what's going to happen. Right? Worrying about this, anxious about that. Fantasizing about this. The middling or lowly can't help wondering, will this house hut perish or not? What's going to happen? Huh? What's going to happen if I trust? 
What's going to happen if I commit? What's going to happen if I truly let go? Right? You know what he's calling that? Middling or lowly. Just, I mean, that's, those aren't my words. <laughs> Again, this is not about drinking the Kool-Aid. This is about important things, real things, healthy things. Is that clear? If every day you got in your car and you wondered, is this car going to crash? Am I going to crash? Am I going to... Right? Is somebody going to hit me? Is this... My brake's going to fail. I mean, what would it be like driving your car? If, 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 if that's the way you were thinking. Would it be a pleasant ride? Yeah. Would you be at ease enjoying the ride? No, you'd be what? Stressed. Stressed. Well, many of us live our daily life that way. Middle or lowly, can't help wondering, will this hat perish or not? Perishable or not? The original master is present, not dwelling south or north, east or west. Who is the original master? It is your original mind, always present. Right? Right, Lester? <coughs> there. <laughs> there it is again, right? How easy, isn't it? Yeah. Right. right. When the when the meditation bell rings, I put on my shoes and I go to the meditation hall. It's just like that. I don't have to think about it. Do I want to go? Do I not want to go? Do I feel like going? What's going to happen if I get there? I wonder how my meditation's going to be. Uh, you, know, you know, I wonder if my legs are going to hurt. I'm, you know what I mean? It's not that. When the bell rings, I put on my shoes and I go to the hall. I take a seat. That's all. See how clean and simple that is. I mean, that's what you're going to do anyhow. But look how, look how we drive ourselves crazy. As Chris says, make ourselves miserable. For what? Perishable or not, the original master who is beyond perishable or not is present. Doesn't dwell here and not there. Not to, right, it's always here. The mind of awareness, the mind of wakefulness, the mind of presence, the mind of being, whatever you want to call it, the original mind, the Buddha mind, is always here. Able to just be present to whatever arises. For those of you who are anxious, always worrying about the future, what's going to happen. Relax. When you get there, you'll find out. Be surprised. It may not be as you think. <laughs> Perishable and not the original master, master is present, not dwelling south or north, east or west. Firmly based on steadiness, it cannot be surpassed. It cannot be surpassed. It is steady. Awareness is steady. Right? You're just aware. There's nobody who is aware, 
and there's no thing that you gotta grasp at, you just need to be aware. Just be present. Eyes open, ears open, nose open, mouth open, tongue open, body open, mind open. What? There it is. That's steady. That's steady because it is not tossed about by the comings and goings of life. Many people in life are not steady. They're up, they're down. They're in, they're out. Right? They go forward, they go backwards. They go left, they go right. Right? You know. Some go around in circles. <laughs> right? No emotional steadiness. No mind steadiness. No life steadiness. Just, just driven around by circumstances. Things are going well, you're happy. Things are going uh, not the way you want, you're unhappy. You're, you're angry, you're resentful one day. The next day you're anxious and scared. The next day you're happy, everything's wonderful. The next day you're miserable. I mean, it's like, you know, firmly based on steadiness. Every day is a good day. Steady. You know? one step after the other. Doesn't matter what you're stepping on, you're always firm in your footing. It can't be surpassed. A shining window below the green pines, jade palaces, vermilion towers, can't compare with it. Somebody might say, oh, right. To have a little house, beautiful big windows, looking out on the river, that can't be surpassed. A palace made of jade, vermilion towers, places of great beauty cannot be surpassed. He says, your own awareness, your own true mind cannot be surpassed. Because it is the source of anything. How if if <laughs> how could we appreciate that if we didn't have a mind? What what's appreciating that? Your very own mind. That is the jewel. It allows us everything. And yet we never give recognition to it. Questions about this? Yes. Thank you for the teaching and the way that you were able to present something so deep. Um, I, I just have one issue with one premise that you made. The, the premise is that, that this is our natural state, our natural mind. Um, in the morning when, when we do the incense offering, and, and today it was Angie, and, and the last line of the incense offering is, may we remember to awaken from forgetfulness and realize our true home. That's something that we have to remember. If it was so natural, then why do we have to remember it? Because you've forgotten it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's why. Not, it's not natural. Yes, it is natural. It's just you've forgotten how to be natural, Alex. This, it's different. You've forgotten how to be natural. You were born natural. Okay? You were born natural. When you took their hand, you had complete confidence. That was natural. You see it expressed in every living creature. That. If we no longer feel that way, it is because we have become unnatural. 
We have to understand that. When we talk about returning to our primordial nature, our original nature, we're talking about, you know, in Zen it's often expressed, what was your original face before your parents were born? Which means, before all the conditioning, before a shit happens, okay, speaking quite bluntly, you know, who were you? What were you? That's what we're getting at, right? And that's, you know, for many of us, it seems a long way back, right? Wow, you know, I mean, like I got to go back to, uh, uh, you know, you know, to being uh, three months old. <laughs> no, because that mind is still here. It's just been covered up. You shared with me on many occasions how when you were studying as a student in India and you would have great masters that you were working with them, and they would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and they could meditate for 3 or 4 hours before they started their day. Mm -hmm. These were masters that you respected. They had this natural understanding of the nature. Then why did they have to practice every day? They practiced for you. Practice for, for you, Alex. <laughs> They practiced for you. They had to get ready for you. <laughs> Are we clear? Yeah. If it wasn't for people like you, they could get up at seven, have a cup of tea. <laughs> right? Relax, take a nap, you know. But, you know, it's people like us that keep these guys busy. <laughs> Are we clear? <laughs> Good. <laughs> now, just sitting with head covered, all things are at rest. Thus, this mountain monk doesn't understand at all. Uh, just sitting with head covered, all things are at rest. I mean, I'm not quite sure whether that's sort of some kind of meditation blanket or shawl that, you know, that they would sit with, which, which very much could be, or whether he's referring to kind of Bodhidharma, who was known to sit with a, a blanket over him. He was from India. He was quite cold in China. <laughs> so, so either way, uh, he's, he's, he's really referring uh, to just sitting, huh? doing nothing. Just sitting with head covered, all things are at rest. Doing nothing. Do we want to come to rest? Just sitting, doing nothing. is the place to begin. Just sitting, doing nothing. We are always entering the world. Right? We're always muddying the waters. We think we know best. We think we know right. We think we know what's best for everybody in our life. Don't we? Don't we? We even think we know what's best for ourselves. And yet we just keep continue to muddy the waters. Just come to rest. A mind that is not stirred up. And all things will come to rest. We have seen the world of activity. We have endlessly seen the world of things stirred up. Are we willing to give some time to seeing the way things are when things are at rest? When the mind is at rest? That might be an interesting viewpoint. Yes. Is that what true meditation is? Yeah, true meditation is 
at the end of the day, just sitting with a mind at rest, open, spacious, no thought of anything. That doesn't mean thoughts don't arise. In Zen it's called uh, thinking, <laughs> thinking, the thinking of non-thinking, which is beyond thinking and not thinking. It is, in the, it's, it is in the experience where thoughts just come and go. They just arise and pass away. There's no grasping at them. There's no deliberateness to them. You, you uh, let thoughts in their empty, spacious nature just come and go, like you let sounds come and go, sights come and go. Uh, yeah, the mind is at rest. Now, obviously, to take that mind off the cushion and into the world of activity is called the action of non-action or the non-action of action which means outwardly we are doing but inwardly the mind is at rest it's not doing I'm not doing anything the dishes are washing themselves like right now there appears to be somebody here talking Right? You might say, oh, Fred's giving a Dharma talk. But when, there's nobody here. And the words are just coming out. I have no idea what I'm saying. How can that be? It's the talking, it's the non talking of talking. We free things to be as they are and let our own natural mind and wisdom understanding come through. We don't have to make it up. We don't have to write it all out in advance. Trust the mind. Trust our innate wisdom. Get out of the way. Stop thinking that we're the prime mover of everything. Right? How'd that happen? You know, if you ask me how this happens, I don't, I would say, I don't have a clue. Right? But somebody might say, oh, but, but you made it happen. Really? Alex probably has a scientific explanation. <laughs> <laughs> but what you can explain is why did I do it now and not a minute ago? Why that? Why this thought and not that thought? Just sitting with head covered, all things are at rest. Thus this old monk doesn't understand at all. He's given up intellectual understanding. He's given up analyzing and figuring it out. There is a deeper understanding. I mean, isn't it enough just to know this is this? I mean, do I have to think, how did it get here? All right, right. No. Do I have to think about what a flower is? No. Actually, if I do that, I'll miss what's called the thusness the flowerness of this. That's the essential. And it's not just flowers, it's people. We don't see each other. We see our thoughts, our judgments, our assessments, our views of each other. I mean, what would happen if we gave all that up and just were present to each other and saw what happened? That's the wonderful thing about little children. They're just present to you. Right? That's a wonderful thing about puppies. Right? They're just present. They have no agenda. They're not thinking anything. Right? That's why they can be so loving. Right? That's why they can be so happy to see you. Even if they just saw you 10 minutes ago. 
It's as, it's as if you've been away for, for, for centuries. Why is that? Why do they have that capacity? Because they are present and they are connected and they trust. They're at ease. Thus this mountain monk doesn't understand at all. This mountain monk is just living moment to moment, very alive and present. He's not trying to figure anything out. There's a <laughs> there's a dialogue with that shit too where somebody he says uh, uh, he says something like uh, you know the enlightened person. Somebody asks him about the enlightened person. He says, "Oh, the enlightened person, uh, you know, has a deep understanding of Buddha Dharma." And then the monk says, uh, "You know, uh, do you understand Buddha Dharma?" He says, "Not at all." What is Buddha Dharma? It's a word. Can you point to it and say, oh, there's Buddha Dharma? No, it's, a, it's something we talk about. But when you live it, it becomes alive, becomes a living, a living experience uh, that cannot really be understood by words. It can only be experienced. Again, and one might say, then, then why, uh, you know, then why read Dharma books, right? Why come to retreat and hear Dharma talks, right? One could say that. Well, it's sort of like what he said yesterday, where he said, uh, I have to come here so I can understand that. When you understand that, then you don't need the finger pointing. Right? As long as you're looking, hey, where is the moon? I don't see the moon. It'd be nice to have somebody point it out to you. Right? But once you know where it is, right? You don't need the pointer anymore, do you? Thus the mountain monk doesn't understand at all. Living here, he no longer, she no longer, longer works to get free. As the master said to the student who said, Master, <coughs> please free me from my delusions. And the master said, Who is it that has bound you? At that moment, the monk was enlightened. Because when he looked for that, that which had bound him, he could not find anything. He realizes his, his, his perceived boundings, boundings, were just stuff of his mind. They weren't real. Often I say to people who uh, carry around with them lots of issues. And these issues seem very real to them. Very controlling of their behavior. I ask them, please show me this issue. Anything this big and controlling, I would love to see. Please go into your mind and please show me that issue. And they look and they laugh. Well, it's not there. Well, hold on. You either have an issue or you don't have an issue. Right? You can't have it both ways. You know, this is like, oh, yes, they're just stories, except these are real stories. You know, issues are either real or they're not real. And if they're real, you should be able to see them. Just because you appear or you feel doesn't mean that's true. Does it? 
Hmm? Anybody want to show me an issue? They have. <laughs> Issues will not bear scrutiny. They will disappear on you. And then when they appear in a certain situation, you will forget that and you'll think they're real and you will act that way. Wisdom is, is learning from experience. Insight, if it's powerful, transforms you. Inside, if it's just intellectual, will do very little for you. You'll end up like Woody Allen, <laughs> right? Still totally neurotic, <laughs> but he knows he. But but he knows he is. Right? A lot of money and gone into psychotherapy. That guy. Anybody have an issue they want to show me? What's your issue? I love chocolate. You love chocolate. <laughs> show me show me this love of chocolate. Well, I, I can taste it right now. I smell it. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are just imaginary things you're going on. What is that? You don't know. You, you know. You love chocolate. All right. But there's no solid thing inside you that you were programmed with from, from childhood that's, you know, you, that's like love chocolate, must have chocolate. Is there? <laughs> well, please find out. You know, you didn't come out of the womb asking for chocolate, did you? No. You were quite satisfied back then with what? Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Before spaghetti. Yeah, I don't think I don't I don't think your mother fed you spaghetti at birth. But I'm not aware of every ethnic uh, community. What what did they feed you at birth, your mother? Breast milk. Breast milk. Is that clear? <laughs> you did not have a yearning for chocolate. Causes and conditions created that. And that's, and that's all. There's nothing solid or permanent about your yearning for chocolate, right? If, 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 if I said to you, Barb, today I will give you $1 million if you never eat chocolate again. Sold. Sold! <laughs> and this from the woman five minutes ago who said, you know, I have to have chocolate. <laughs> right. In a minute, she abandons that issue. <laughs> yeah. The price is high enough. I'll have no issues. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That shows us <laughs> something. <laughs> but there's some wisdom in that. <laughs> I think we'll stop at that. Uh, so again, uh, it is noon. Uh, this is our half hour of outdoor walking uh, meditation. Again, as I said uh, this morning, uh, this is our final full day of retreat. We have a half day tomorrow. Uh, so please, put, put the spirit of what was shared in the Dharma talk into practice. Practice uh, just be. When walking, just walk. But when we say just walk, that means you walk with a sense of embodiment. You know, you're in your body, you're aware of your body as it moves, you're aware of your body as it touches. And when your eyes, you're, you know, again, you are wakeful. You see, you see what's in front of you. You're not indifferent to the world around you. 
You see and you smell and you hear, taste, you feel. Okay? It's like that. that means, that's what it means to be fully embodied. You're in your body. Your senses are your body. They are part of your body. They're part of your physicalness. If we walk about and we are not in touch with reality, and we're just in touch with our thoughts, we are not living in life as it is. We are not living in reality. And we will experience disconnection. Mindfulness connects us, reconnects us to life. Please uh, practice that way. 